Gout a fashionable disease. Surprised right? Gout has been referred to as the king's disease for millennia since it primarily affects men who consume a high-fat diet and excessive alcohol. Gout was first mentioned by physicians in ancient Greek writings who claimed that only affluent persons could contract the condition. And when royalty, such as Henry VIII, developed gout, the ailment became popular. Everyone wanted to look like royalty despite the implications. For example throughout the Victorian era, tuberculosis was fashionable due of how pallid it made individuals look. Also, the Europeans sought after gout as a prestige symbol. In reality, there have always been fashions in the world of beauty throughout history. However, before making any changes to your body, think twice. Men asserted that gout prevented other illnesses in the 16th century, and some even referred to it as an aphrodisiac. Oh my goodness. Welcome back to History Rediscovered. In this episode we discuss gout, the disease that nearly wiped out all ancient kings and the elite. Gout was called the disease of kings because it was linked to a rich diet. Gout was initially identified as a disease by the Egyptians in 2640 BC. By the 5th century BC, Hippocrates had identified its crippling nature and referred to it as the unwalkable sickness. He frequently used aphorisms to explain things, and they hold up today. He called gout the arthritis of the rich or the king's illness because he thought that only the wealthy were susceptible to the malady. At that time you couldn't agree more because only the wealthy contracted it. Technology has made it clear that uric acid in the blood causes gout, gout is caused by a condition known as hyperuresemia, where there is too much uric acid in the body. The body makes uric acid when it breaks down purines, which are found in your body and the foods you eat. But traditional physicians attributed the condition to a simpler cause, rich diets. Gout is characterized by intense pain, frequently in the foot or joints. And although gout may seem like a disease of the past, it is actually becoming more common in the United States right now. Alcohol drinking and excessive eating have both been associated to gout. Moreover, gout was referred to as the disease of kings since only the wealthy could afford the diet that caused it. Since it offered tangible evidence of riches, gout was portrayed in some ages as desirable. Gout appears to immediately improve the patient's social standing. After all, those who had gout were politically well-connected and wealthy. Henry VIII and Benjamin Franklin suffered from gout. Due to his fixation with producing a male successor in the 16th century, King Henry VIII divorced both of his wives and left the Catholic Church. Henry was one of the most well-known gout sufferers in history, so the king's anger was not just about the line of succession. Henry was severely overweight, and like all extremely wealthy individuals in his era, he had a poor diet. Meat consumption was predominant, and little to no fruits or vegetables were consumed. He consumed at least 5,000 calories daily, according to estimates. He developed extreme obesity and weighed about 400 pounds when he passed away. Thus, gout and diabetes. He enjoyed jousting as a young man and took multiple blows to the head as a result. One seemed to be really serious. Several people attribute his rapid change in personality to his head injury. He reportedly also had syphilis, which would account for his sickly kids. Regrettably, his doctors were unaware of these illnesses. Henry had the unfortunate experience of being alive during a time when there were no antibiotics or painkillers, as well as little to no medical expertise. A few decades previously, Piero the Gouty was the moniker given to Florence's Medici king because he suffered from severe gout. Not just kings and other authorities suffered from gout. Franklin owned it as well. Franklin begged, what have I done to deserve these awful sufferings, in a 1780 letter to Madame Gout. Gout responded, several things, you have eaten and drunk too much, and you have indulged those legs of yours in their laziness too much, in response to the discourse. One doctor suggested eating kittens and geese as a cure. Gout remedies ranged from acupuncture in ancient China to the consumption of autumn crocuses in the Byzantine Empire. The oddest gout cure, though, was discovered in a 1518 medical text. Acupuncture was used as a cure for gout in ancient China, and the Byzantine Empire prescribed eating fall crocuses. But the most bizarre gout treatment was described in a book of medicine from 1518. Dr. Lorenz Fries offered an odd recipe, a fat old goose is roasted and stuffed with cats, lard, incense, wax, and rye flour. All of this must be consumed, and the dripping must be applied to the hurting joints. The Byzantines may have had the best solution out of all previous cures. Today, gout is still treated with colchicine, a drug derived from the autumn crocus. Many believed gout enhanced sexual performance. Several people thought that gout was an aphrodisiac between the 26th and 18th centuries. Essayist Michel de Mon said in 1588 that a man's genital organs are richer, more nourished, and more vigorous, when his legs are weak. 
Additionally, he suggested that because the floor limits exercise, persons who are affected by it lose less strength and participate in Venusian sports more fully. In 1562, a doctor stated that males with gout are more likely to compel to live joyful lives, aside from the discomfort itself. So, the gout restores them to Venus with greater prowess rather than making them infertile. A Dutch author claimed in 1693 that gout allowed male reproductive organs to rest, for when a patient who is suffering from gout is forced to lie on his back, anyone who knows that the kidneys are the origin of the sperm channels can easily and at his leisure comprehend that the loins and kidneys are hot and inflamed. The disease affected the feet, giving victims the sensation that they are walking on eyeballs. Gout sufferers describe their illness as excruciating. Thomas Sydenham, a doctor, stated in a writing from the late 17th century that gout was so excruciatingly painful as to not withstand the weight of the clothing or the shaking of the space caused by someone moving quickly around it. According to Sydenham, the great toe would typically be the pain that would awaken patients. He compared it to feeling like a dislocated bone. Sidney Smith described his gout attacks as being similar to walking on eyeballs in the 19th century. And this is immediately succeeded by a chillness, shivering, and a slight fever. The pain, which is mild in the beginning, grows gradually more violent every hour. The big toe is the most common location for gout attacks, and many patients experience their first gout attack there. However, gout can occur in any joint of the body, including the hands, elbows, knees, and ankles. When patients have chronic gout, it is common for numerous joints to be afflicted. Some people wanted gout because they believed it would protect them from other diseases. Gout wasn't just a sickness of the wealthy, it was also considered a preventative condition. Horace Walpole proposed that gout prevents other ailments and prolongs life in the 18th century. Could I cure that gout, should I not experience a fever, a palsy, or an apoplexy? He continued. The wealthy were more likely to suffer from gout than the poor, thus Europeans may have thought that gout protected them from the more widespread ailments. Copeman refers to a comment in the London Times in 1900, the common cold is well named. But the gout seems instantly to raise the patient's social status. I regard the gout to be a treatment and not a sickness, and being so no wonder there is no medicine for it. Nor do I seek to be totally cured of a remedy, said Walpole. To treat gout, doctors used glass boots, flannel, and gout stools. Gout sufferers were advised to take a break from their feet while they were sick. A gout stool has been recommended by doctors for millennia to reduce inflammation. Doctors would wrap the foot in flannel during flare-ups and advise the patient to wait for the episode to pass, which could take two weeks. Early in the 20th century, medical professionals created a glass boot to cure gout. Doctors would use the boot to apply heat throughout the procedure. The dangerous side effect of this medication was that it would displace the uric acid in the joints that was the root of the flare-up. After leaving the joint, the uric acid moved onto the kidneys, where it could induce organ failure or result in death. Gout was examined through the microscope by the father of microbiology Van Leeuwenhoek. Gout has been described by doctors for generations without any awareness of how the disease actually looks. Hippocrates, who lived approximately 400 BCE, made the connection between gout and phlegm. Yet in 1679, Antony Van Leeuwenhoek was the first to examine gout. The father of microbiology, Van Leeuwenhoek, recognized the gout crystals as I observed the solid matter which to our eyes resembles chalk, and saw to my great astonishment that I was mistaken in my opinion, for it consisted of nothing but long, transparent little particles, many pointed at both ends and about four axes of the globules in length. I cannot better describe, we saw with the naked eye, pieces from a horsetail cut to a length of one-sixth of an inch. Historically, gout has been considered to be primarily a male disease. The fact that women can also develop gout was first recognized during the reign of Nero, AD 54-68, by Seneca, who observed, in this age, women rival men in every kind of lasciviousness. Why need we then be surprised at seeing so many of the female sex afflicted with the gout? In the modern era, although gout remains primarily a disease of men in middle age, it has become increasingly more frequent in women, particularly after the menopause.